I'm very glad that you chose to join us for worship of our Savior on this day we call Good Friday. And you know, this is a day that has such a mixture of emotions, isn't it? We call it Good Friday. And yet it seems that it's always important to remember that it's solemn and it's sober and it's serious. We come face to face by looking in the mirror of why Jesus came. Because it was the only, if he would pay the price for our sins, that we could have any hope of redemption or forgiveness or be able to call a day like this that seems so dark good. In fact, it's our best day in many ways. And tonight we're going to take a look at this theme, he knew. There are a lot of facets of Good Friday and maybe certain things that really strike your heart and your mind, all right? Maybe it's the suffering and how he was beaten and whipped and nails driven through his hands and the the physical agony. Maybe it was the the emotional torture that he received that the the chief priests of his own people and the soldiers and the the criminals on the cross, they taunted him and made fun of him and and jeered him and, and how that must have played with his mind. Maybe just that thought of just that handful of women and John, the one disciple that were courageous enough to watch him suffer and die. But we're going to back up about 24 hours before the cross and and take a look at something that's unique and that the scriptures tell us that Jesus knew. Jesus knew. This was not a happenstance of circumstances that accidentally took place that Jesus ended up on the cross. He knew full well And he still came. And he still went through it because it was the only way to truly love you to the fullest extent and to the end. And I pray that you're blessed as you consider that with me tonight. That he knew and he still went through it. So, I'm going to ask a couple of favors. First, make sure that you sign the little friendship cards. If you don't have one in the pew in which you're sitting, maybe you can reach behind or ahead and grab one. Just to give us a record of your visit, we'd greatly appreciate that. Fill that out and you may drop that in one of the uh, receptacles, the boxes out in the lobby area. Same thing will be true of an offering. If you'd like to contribute in support of the ministry here, there's a box that's appropriate for dropping that in after the service today. After that's been taken care of and you fill those cars out, why don't you just, whoever's closest to you tonight, please say hello to one another and greet one another tonight. Our entire service tonight will be on the screens, uh, so we'll make that uh, a, an easy way for you to follow along our worship service tonight. It seems only appropriate that we start with, by confessing our sins, because that's why we're here, to come face to face with them, and what made Jesus hang on the cross. It was your sins, and it was my sins that put him there. And, and so we begin our worship with our confession. On this day known by followers of Christ as Good Friday, God to focus our hearts on his cross of sorrow and shame. We seek his forgiveness, mercy, and renewal. We mourn and struggle to understand the depth of Christ's love, that he should suffer our punishment and die our death. Our hearts are heavy as we gather to bear witness to the agony of Jesus' crucifixion knowing full well that we are guilty sinners, deserving of the consequences of our sinfulness. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. At times we have the evil we encounter in our lives and gleefully run toward it. At times we have denied any connection or relationship to our Lord through indifferent thoughts, words, and actions. 
At times we have betrayed our baptismal commitment to our Lord, either consciously or unconsciously. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Almighty God, we have no source of hope but you. Look with compassion on this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to serve as substitute. Turn our broken and contrite hearts to those that genuinely cherish Jesus' willingness to be given into the hands of sinners, to suffer torment upon a cross, and even to die, that we might have new and eternal life. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. As a fellow servant of our crucified Savior, I invite you to trust his grace and mercy. It is not a grace easily won nor inexpensive. This grace, offered to you at no cost, costs the life of God's one and only Son. It is by His authority that I proclaim to you the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We'll join in our first worship hymn.
invite your attention to our first scripture lesson tonight, taken from the prophet Micah. This Old Testament prophet is used by God, the Holy Spirit, to just take a look at the world around him, and it doesn't give him much hope. What he sees in every person, people who were once called the people of God, he sees brokenness broken truth and broken relationships and broken lives. And basically God uses him to warn again, this life is not the one that you can put any stock in. Don't even trust the ones in your own home. And he comes to that point where you think, if he stops right here, it's, it's really quite hopeless. But then he says, but I will wait for my Savior. And I know that in him there's mercy. Micah says, the faithful have been swept from the land. Not one upright person remains. Everyone lies in wait to shed blood. They hunt each other with nets. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. The ruler demands gifts. The judge accepts bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright, worse than a thorn hedge. The day God visits you has come. The day your watchmen sound the alarm. Now is the time of your confusion. Do not trust a neighbor. Put no confidence in a friend. Even with the woman who lies in your embrace, guard the words of your lips. For a son dishonors his father. A daughter rises up against her mother. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the members of his own household. But as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for God my Savior. My God will hear me. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be faithful to Jacob and show love to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our ancestors in days long ago. This is the word of the Lord. We'll continue with two verses of response from Jesus, your blood and righteousness. next scripture lesson we read from the letter to the Hebrew Christians. I read from chapter 10 beginning at verse 4. And Here's where we can connect the dots between that one name, that moniker that Jesus gets as our great high priest and the cross on Good Friday. God's Old Testament people over and over again they saw the priest function. The high priest and those of the tribe of Levi as sons and day after day, they offered sacrifice, morning sacrifice, evening sacrifice. They heard the animals squeal and the blood be shed and the, the burnt offering, symbolizing that sin had a high costly price. It cost a life. And yet none of those sacrifices forgave sin. 
They were a symbol. They were to remind them of the seriousness of their sin and the only solution that would come through that promised Messiah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And here in this text, it it is said so well. If we get lured into thinking that by doing the right things, doing all the religious right rituals and doing the sacrifices that God is pleased and I'm forgiven on the basis of what I do, then this is not a good Friday for us. In fact, it's a day we don't even need if that's what we believe. And that's why this is so important where he says only Jesus, our high priest, could offer sacrifice once for all so that we might absolutely be certain of our forgiveness. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and their lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. This is the word of the Lord. We'll continue with two verses of response from Jesus, my great high priest. Gospel New Testament lesson is recorded in Luke's Gospel. I read from chapter 23, beginning at verse 26. This is the account of our Savior's crucifixion. And since it centers on our Savior's word and works, why don't we stand out of reverence for Him? As the soldiers led Him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. 
A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us! And to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine, vinegar, and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but... This man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. This is the word of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. We'll continue by hearing an anthem.
your glory is so beautiful. I fall on to my knees in awe. And the heartbeat of my life is to worship in your light. Your glory is so beautiful. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior who loved us and gave himself for us, your fellow redeemed. We're going to spend a little time in the upper room, not on top of the hill, not looking at the cross just yet, but in the room. And you remember many of the details of that Monday, Thursday evening where the room, they found it just as Jesus said they would. They found a man carrying a water jar, and they found a room all prepped. They got the Passover ready. All of them were there. They had their perfect number, their minion. There were 13 of them there. The roasted lamb dinner was all set and ready to go. And at the beginning, Jesus does this, this weird and awkward thing where he, he strips down and he washes their feet. He takes the role of a servant and, and washes those, those 20 26 dirty feet and there's so much going on in that room but it's always interesting to me to read these first few verses of John chapter 13 so these are the first thing that the Holy Spirit inspires before we get to all of those details the institution of the Lord's Supper and the celebration of the Passover and, and all of those that interaction between Jesus and the disciples so please listen Jesus knew let that just sink in for a minute. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own and who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus knew every last 
detail that was going to unfold. Every break in the relationship between he and Judas, he and Peter, he and the other 11, Jesus knew that he was going to be dragged through a kangaroo court in front of Ananias and Caiaphas, the high priest, and Pilate, the Roman governor. He knew the abuse and the beatings that he was going to receive. He knew it all. And it's amazing to me when you think about that fact that he still would come and still go through it and still love you to the end. Love me to the end. You know what that's like? Have you ever been invited out by somebody to dinner? And, and you already volunteered to pay for the tab. Oh, it's our turn. No problem. And all of a sudden they start ordering the filet mignon. And they, they order a $250 bottle of wine. And, and no doubt they're going to have chocolate mousse for dessert. right? And all of a sudden you're having these crazy thoughts like, well, if I would have known that this was the way that they were going to play the game, I don't think we would have gone out. Right? Now, I'm not trying to make light of this, but, but think about what Jesus knew. What he knew he was getting himself into. And the price it was going to cost him. And try and understand how much you're worth to him. How much you mean to him. How much value you hold to him. He knew and still came for you. Let's explore it the way the text does. He knew. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. If I were going to put that in, in my kind of speak, I would say it this way. He knew who and what he was. And that makes the fact that he came and died on Calvary even more amazing. He knew who and what he was. He was. Have you ever asked your child, okay, it's time to take the dogs out for a walk, or it's time to go out in the yard and pick up all the, you know what? And they kind of give you that, do I have to? I don't want to do that. When we're asked to do something uncomfortable or something distasteful or something that we think is beneath us, we kind of put our hands on our hips and go, do I have to? I don't want to. And my friends, if anyone had a right to say, I don't want to, this is beneath me. This is way below my pay grade. Would have been our Savior Jesus. He knew full well who he was. He was the divine son of God, one with the Father in every extent, the creator of heaven and earth. This is the Jesus that you and I know, right? Sets the stars in the sky in their proper place and calls them each by name every night. When he created the world, he set the boundaries for the oceans themselves. Here's where the dry land begins and here's where the ocean starts and none of no waves, no farther. Here is the God who created us. Read Psalm 139. Remember that one? He's knit me together the very bones and ligaments and sinews and nerve endings and blood vessels and corpuscles. He's put them all together and before there's a word on my lips or a thought in my brain or a desire in my heart, he already knows it. This is the God who sends the cold wintry blasts out of his storehouses. He is in control of all things. And I'm trying to imagine the conversation when the father said to him, I have a job for you to do. You know, everything is all perfect for you and for me. And that's a lovely thing. And the angels are here at our beck and call. But we've got this little orb in this one corner of the universe called Earth. And every soul will perish if you don't go. I know it's a horrible mission, but I need you to do this. You see Jesus with his hands on his hip? For them? 
He fully knew who he was and what he had. All power. You know, picture that same Monday Thursday when the disciples were trying to pull their swords out. And Jesus says, put those stupid things away. Don't you know that I could call down 12 legions of angels right now and they'd be here and take care of this problem? I know who I am. And I know what authority I have. But it must be this way so that the scriptures can be fulfilled. We heard about it last Sunday on Palm Sunday. The humility of our Jesus. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be held on to for dear life or grass. But he made himself nothing taking on the very form of a servant. Because that was the only way to love you. That was the only way to redeem you. That he could be like you to take your place in life and in death. He knew. He completely knew who he was. What he was. Look at what he tells when he's questioned by the high priest. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The God of all creation, the ruler of the universe, thought you were worth it. And even though he knew what it meant to him, he came for you. He knew. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. I would put it this way. He knew what he had come to do. Uh, let, let's get something straight, all right? When, when the scripture said that Jesus knew that it was time for him to leave and go back to the Father, that may strike a lot of chords in your heart. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe uh, a little melancholy, maybe a little maudlin, maybe a little sad. Of, oh, if Jesus knew it was time to go. Had to say goodbye to his friends. And that's always hard, right? It is hard. I, I, I had a mother... God rest her soul. She just died in February and she's now home in heaven and she's going to have a much better Easter than I'm going to have. But by my mom, when we would drive over to Michigan and, and visit her, she had a terrible time with goodbyes. I mean, we'd, we'd do all the hugging and all the requisite saying, I love you with all my heart. You know, God be with you and bless you and watch over you and I'll call you when we get home to let you know we get safe. And she would always say, and I love you too and drive safe, take your time, don't be in a hurry. And then she'd stand on the front porch or in the driveway and just cry like a baby. I got a granddaughter that does the same thing. I don't know where she got that from. <laughs> Goodbye, stink. That's not what's going on here. Jesus knew what he had come to do. And he knew what he had to do. He knew all about the betrayal and the suffering. The 40 stripes save one. He knew about the blood loss and the shock. He knew about the infection. He knew that the soldiers would crown him and put a robe around him and bow down before him and make fun of him. And when you think about not only the, the physical torture he see, but the mental gymnastics and the torture that he was made subject to, it, it's almost unbearable. When you think about the blood loss and, and all else that went on, his lungs finally filled up and that he couldn't breathe anymore or stretch himself out to gasp one more air. But worse than that, he suffered our hell. What it was like to have the Father turn his back on him and look away and say, there. Now suffer their punishment, their separation, their ultimate punishment for sin. He knew all that. And yet he went through that because of his love for you. And I don't know that that we can fully comprehend that. And that's why these words mean so much to me when I think about Good Friday. I can't fathom that kind of love. That kind of knowledge, and yet that he still allowed himself to be put through that. 
And yet Jesus made no secret of it to his disciples. In Luke chapter 9, he said, And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. This is the second of three times that Jesus sat the guys down. He said, fellas, listen, you need to know why I'm here and you need to know what's going to happen. I'm not going to hide it from you. What you deserve, your suffering, your death, your punishment, is what I'm going to take on me. When the scriptures tell us that Jesus knew that, that the hour had come, that Jesus knew that in less than 24 hours he would be on that cross, suffering our punishment, and that he would do that to love us to the fullest extent, that is what makes this day Good Friday. He knew, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He knew who he had come to love. And here's where you and I find hope and and peace and comfort. He knew all about Judas and that he had been sold out for 30 silver coins and that he would betray him into the hands of the chief priests and the Pharisees. He knew. He knew what was in Judas's heart and yet he still washed his feet and he still fed him and he still tried to coax Joel to repent. He even made it so plain, the one who dips his hand with me into the bowl, is it me? And yes, it is you. He tried to the very end to get him to repent, to receive the forgiveness that only Jesus could win and offer to him. He knew about big, bold, brash Peter. Peter had his good moments. Who do men say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yes. But he was also that same guy that in a matter of an hour or so was going to say, Jesus, who's he? I don't know who he is. I've never heard of the guy. I'm not one of his disciples. Yeah, I may be Galilean, but don't hold that against me. He knew about James and John, people with big egos and big dreams and calling down the thunder of the gods, wipe these miserable ingrates out, who were all worried about sitting on Jesus' left hand and his right hand, positions of power and respect. Oh, he knew about their egos. And he knew about Matthew the tax collector, who really enjoyed having the Roman goon soldiers at his disposal so that he could line his pockets whenever he wanted. And he knew about Simon, that zealot. You know, the Simon, the one of the short sword, that his motto in life was the only good Roman is a dead Roman. He knew exactly who he had come to love. And he knows the ones sitting in these pews who don't have a good handle on their use of alcohol. And he knows the people in these pews who have got way too comfortable with pornography. And he knows the little boys and little girls who talk back to their mom and dad and have no respect for time. And he knows the husbands and wives who give each other that look that could kill on the spot because they're so angry and so disappointed. And he knows those who are proud. Proud as though they walk on water. At least they walk a few feet above everybody else who always have the right answer. And look down their noses at the end of all those people who aren't quite up to snuff. He knows about the lies you've told. He knows about the secrets that we harbor. He knows the ugly part of us that nobody else ought to know. He knew. He still came. Still loves you. He always will. That's what makes this day Good Friday. 
He knew exactly who he had come to love, the likes of us. And he loved us to the end. He showed us the full extent that he said, you are so valuable to me. I love you so much. My love for you is so unfailing and so inexpressible that I'll go to the cross. Christ died. Think about these descriptors because they describe us. Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? How beautiful to think he knew and he still came. He knew who and what he was. He knew what he had come to do. And he knew who he had come to love. And that's you, my friend. He did on that Good Friday and he does today. Simple truth. He knew. And he loves you. Amen. We're going to continue our service with two verses of response from Upon the Cross Extended. Just as a reminder to you that if you have an offering you'd like to contribute in support of the gospel ministry here at Bethany, you may make that in the receptacle out in the lobby after the service, or you may use the website at bethanyappleton.org slash give and make a gift online. We're going to continue with a response of prayer that will help us remember the seven last words of our Savior Jesus on the cross, and in between we'll sing one verse of O oh, Dearest Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, you did not seek revenge on those who tormented you, but demonstrated a remarkable and illogical kindness to your enemies. Grant us grace-filled hearts to forgive those who hurt us, to overcome evil with good, to love our enemies for your sake, and as the Father's children seek your peace and evermore rejoice in your love. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing.
Lord Jesus, while you hung on the cross, you showed mercy to the dying thief. How frightening death can be to us who are under the curse of the law. We beg of you to look on us also in your loving compassion. And at our last hour, comfort us with your promise that we will dwell forever in paradise with you. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Lord Jesus, while you suffered the agony of the cross, you remembered in love your sorrowing mother. With that same love and pity, bless all parents, especially those whose hearts are torn by the loss of loved ones or burdened with worry over their children. In your mercy, gather all within the peace of your cross so that parent and child will love each other as they love you. Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. Heavenly Father, your Son cried, Why have you forsaken me? When we suffer in this sinful world, Satan loves to have us believe that we are all alone, abandoned, even by you. In times of trial and suffering, do not turn away from us, but give us your presence and your power, which enable us to endure whatever may be set before us through Jesus Christ our Lord. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Savior, brother, friend, you endured not only spiritual anguish, but also physical pain on the cross in our place. You experienced every facet of the human condition. We thirst for the healing that only you can provide. Strengthen us to carry our burdens and to endure our sufferings by the grace of your holy example, always giving you thanks for your love. I am thirsty. Jesus Christ, you are the author and finisher of our faith. You did not stop short of completing the task given to you by your Father. You drank the bitter cup of suffering for our sins down to its last dregs. 
bring to completion everything you intend for us so that as children of the Heavenly Father, we too may do all things well and live for His glory. It is finished. Jesus Christ, as you gave your life on the cross in our place, you commended your spirit into the loving hands of your heavenly Father. Give us the grace to trust in you for all things. When our last hour comes, grant us your peace that we may close our eyes with confidence, knowing that we also will dwell forever in the hands of our heavenly Father. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Crucifixion was complete and the body was in the tomb. Satan thought that he had extinguished the light of the world, that now all was darkness in his playground. He thought he had finally won the day and gained the victory over the Messiah. He had been trying for three years. But we know that all was not lost and that the light of the world, while he may be hidden for our sight, from our sight for three days, we know what's coming. Easter Sunday, when that one who only can say, I am the resurrection and the life, will come and show himself alive so that he might assure us of the victory that he won on Calvary, but also in that beautiful garden. So I'm going to ask that you receive with believing hearts the benediction of your Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. At this time, one of our traditions is to just simply uh, practice the nail of remembrance. If you're comfortable, you may come forward during the, the anthem, place a nail on the cross. It's a good reminder for us that it was our sins that brought our Savior to this world. And even though he knew, he loved you, and he loved you to the end. Oh, to see the dawn of the dawn. See you.